was January the 22nd, 1973, that the United States Supreme Court made the decision that made the abortion legal. According to the AGI, which is Planned Parenthood, and the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, nearly 50 million babies have died, been aborted since 1973. 4% of these were the, for the sake of the mother's life, while the other 96% were for birth control. And abortion allows partial birth abortion through the third trimester. I mean, it's a kid. It's getting pretty close to the one who was born this past week. We read the newspaper and we see where 200,000 are dead from an earthquake in Haiti. 120,000 swept away by a tsunami in some island in the Pacific. 500 are swept away by flooding in Brazil. 32 are killed on a college campus. Four thousand killed by abortion each day. Oh, sorry, the news missed that last one. And our Supreme Court doesn't consider abortion as killing. I have a question, what's death anyway? Well, the coroner describes death as the absence of brain waves. The American Heritage Dictionary describes dead as lifeless, not having the capacity to live, inanimate, lacking feeling or sensitivity or unresponsive. Here's a rock. It don't seem very responsive. Doesn't seem very animate. Must be dead. The only thing, see how polished that rock is? It can wear and wear and wear. It just gets smaller because it's dead. There's no life there to make it grow. There's life. It'll grow. It'll get bigger. Let's turn things around 360 degrees. See what life's considered to be. And again, using the same dictionary, it says it's the interval between birth or conception or interception of an organism and its death. And it describes inception as a beginning of something. If it grows, it's got to be alive. That rock is just going to get smaller. It's going to do absolutely nothing would be a rock. <coughs> now this is a, I'm going to read this. I found it on the internet. And I thought it was pretty interesting. This Baptist preacher named John Piper compared abortion to racism. Now listen real close to this. He says, my aim is that just as once even though the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case of 1857 held that black slaves were property without rights as free persons. Yet, today we view that as unthinkable. So also, even though the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade case of 1973 did not give the unborn the rights of a free person. 
Nevertheless, the day may come when that too is viewed as unthinkable. We can only pray. <coughs> Racism might and often did result in the killing of innocent humans. In our history, it often did. But abortion always resulted in the killing of innocent humans. Between 1882 and 1968, 3,446 black people were lynched in America. Today, more black babies are killed by white abortionists every three days than all who were lynched in those years. And that information came from Life Education and Resource Network. Now, I want to clarify that not so much comparing the abortion as a race issue, but to express the value that our Supreme Court puts on life. I see that unborn baby is having the same right to life that everybody else has got. Amen. Now the Supreme Court agreed that under the 14th Amendment that the right to privacy under due process was extended extended a woman's right to have this abortion. And it allowed the abortions all the way up through the third trimester, which brings it up to about 28 weeks or seven months. <clears throat> the Roe decision defined viable as being potentially able to live outside of the mother's womb all but with artificial aid. So that baby's life can be taken up to a point that it can live on its own with no help outside the mother's womb. Now I have a little trouble understanding the Supreme Court gave this a state's rights, allow the states to make the decisions. I think there's 14 that don't allow abortions. But the original intent of the abortion was for the mother's health, not for birth control. And that's what this country's using for, a convenience for birth control. Oh, I see life, abortion is a matter of life and death. God gives the life and abortion takes it away. How about God's commandments, the sixth one, the one that says thou shalt not kill. The dictionary that we define the other word says to deprive of life. You can't deprive the right of life. It didn't have any life to start with. If that fetus wasn't supposed to grow, God would take care of it. It has a life that will grow. Thou shalt not kill. When that life begins at inception, two things. It either gets killed or it should die of natural causes. The other thing, it ought to be born. Now I want to read to you Psalms 139, 13 to 16. It says, you made all the, the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. 
Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. What an ultrasound. God sees that child before it's even in the womb. And he watches it grow. We can't use an ultrasound. We go over here to the hospital. They can't use an ultrasound and see what God sees. They don't see that baby so tiny that the ultrasound won't even pick it up. God's seen it. God's put his character in that baby. Look at Jeremiah 1 5. <clears throat> it tells us, I knew you before I formed you and your mother's womb. That's pretty remarkable. God knew us before he even formed us in our mother's womb. So we meant to something to God before we even meant something to our mother. God gave us an intelligence to rule over the animals of the world. Tells us that back in Genesis. Yet we may act more barbaric than some of these animals that we rule over. We set up rules and regulations that seem to benefit our needs without the consideration for what God intended. One lap, one rule allows us to abort, to kill an unborn child legally. And here's the one I've always been confused about. Maybe somebody here has an answer. You can go to an abortion clinic, have an unborn child put away. But let somebody kill a mother carrying an unborn child and they get charged with killing a fetus. I've never quite understood how it can be legal one minute and not the next. When you're killing somebody, the Bible says, that shall not kill, that ought to be round the clock. No exceptions. No exceptions. Let's look at Exodus. 21st chapter, verses 22 to 25. I found this pretty interesting. Now suppose two men are fighting, and in the process they accidentally strike a pregnant woman, so she gives birth prematurely. If no further injury results, the man who struck the woman must pay the amount of compensation the woman's husband demands and the judges approve. But if there's further energy, injury, the punishment must match the injury. A life for a life. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, wound for a wound, a bruise for a bruise. I hate to be one of these doctors that's doing all these abortions when judgment day comes. Because I think that verse is right there in Exodus that somebody better do some repent. Does abortion solve the problem? Not really. For women that have had an induced Abortion, I mean speed it up, make it happen before it should have. They suffer for everything from depression to a 50% higher rate of breast cancer. 
and that came from a 1994 study from the, the Journal um, of the National Cancer Institute. And here's one that will just blow your mind. Fear of heaven. There are actually women that have had abortions that fear heaven. They have visions of getting to heaven and seeing their little child standing at the right hand of God, pointing a finger at their mom. That's true. There are women that are actually have, have vision that had nightmares over it. Here's the best part. We've got a savior that makes abortion forgivable. You've heard of Paul, right? Here's what Paul's got to say about being really, really bad. It comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me the strength to do this work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my innocence I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them. But God had mercy on me so that Jesus Christ could use me as a prime example <clears throat> of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. They just didn't get much worse than Paul. I mean, can you imagine <clears throat> the church back in Acts meeting that little building somewhere, probably one of the houses. And here comes the dreaded Paul in persecuting the Christians and killing them. He would have had about the same role as these doctors that are killing the babies now. Because you see, these babies are innocent. Every one of those aborted babies got to take to heaven because they're innocent. And Paul says that we can be forgiven. Jesus already paid the price. That's what verse 15 said. It said Jesus came to the earth to save the sinners. Look at Romans 13, or 10, 13. At first, don't discriminate. It says, every one you call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus paid the price. You're forgiven. What can we do to stop abortion? Pray. We can pray and we can help some of these sinners to try to help some of the young girls. But prayer is the biggest thing.